We, the Ceph project, also provide a POSIX file system, a virtual block device, and an HTTP server that speaks S3 and Swift for you to get your file object block and object storage requirements all in one platform. For the purposes of this talk, it's important to know that a Rados object storage cluster is composed of object storage daemons, or OSDs. They're responsible for storing all the data. They um, are responsible for keeping that, keeping that data redundantly available so that if you lose devices, all your data is still available. And they tend to have CPUs available, which is very exciting for us when you want to send com computation to the storage. Um, from an application's point of view, there's a library, which we'll, we're about to talk about, and they, you know, write, make some, make function calls against that library, and then out in the back end, there's just sort of a Rados cluster that the library magically speaks to. Within Rados, objects are composed of three different pieces. There's sort of a bundle of bytes, data piece, that is what you think of when you think of an object, and you can, you know, they can, they can be arbitrary sizes, they don't need to be the same within a cluster, although there is sort of a, a soft limit at 68 or 128 megabytes or something because they need to be able to fit all in memory at the same time and you need to be able to do certain kinds of computation on them. Um, you can have a small number of X adders. These work just the same way they do on a file on your local file system. In fact, in, depending on how your system's set up, they are X adders in, your, in a local file system. And we have an object map or OMAP, which is a key value database that's associated with a given object. If you're going to build something like a file system on top of Rados, you might decide that you're going to put you know, in every, in every object, you're going to have the path for the file or directory that object represents in an X adder, and the file data lives in the object data, and that every directory entry in a directory is a separate OMAP entry in the system. Librados is the user space library that we, that we use to talk to the Rados cluster. It's available with a bunch of different language bindings. It's got a custom protocol that runs on TCP IP and it talks directly to storage nodes. The Librados API is very rich. You can do basically anything you can do with a file to an object, except that it's an object so you don't have like directory and rename operations. You can address each of those, the bundle of bytes, the X adders, and the key value data with, via Librados. You can do partial overwrites of the data or of individual keys and values in, in, in the OMAP area. And you can construct compound operations that can do all of those things at the same time atomically and that will either fail or succeed as a unit. This is a function that is provided by Librados. It's just the basic write. You have what we call an IO context, which is sort of a handle for talking to the cluster and for the data in the cluster that provides ordering when you want it, well, a certain amount of ordering and that sort of provides the state, your local state about what you're doing. You have to give it the name of the object, the OID, that you want to actually operate on. You provide it a buffer, like a data, the data to write, and because it's in, this is the C binding, then you're providing, you know, a, a character pointer array, or, or a pointer to a character array, and the length of the data to write, and then you're providing the offset of the object that you want to write, because, you know, you might start at zero, you might start at four kilobytes, you might start at 500 bytes, whatever you like. There are a bunch of other functions and some examples that we're going to skip over. Um, this is the C++ version, which is interesting mostly because it shows off we have this class called a buffer list that we use instead of character pointer arrays when you're in C++ and it's designed for efficiently working with buffers. Um, there are ways to construct compound operations in, in Librados, which were mostly going to skip over what's mostly, most interesting about these is those top two. You can assert that the object is a particular version before you perform the operation on it. And on every operation that you perform, you can get the version of the operation when you're done, or the version of the object that it saw when you're done. And that lets you make sure that other users in the system haven't changed an object when you're doing mutations that might involve network round trips. Um, you can also, instead of checking a version, you can compare, you know, an extent within the, within the byte data. Similarly, we can do a lot of things with X adders and OMAPs, and we can do them within those operations, and we have, again, comparison on X adders and comparison on arbitrary numbers of 
OMAP keys and values to make sure that they all match up before you allow operations to proceed. Is this bundle atomic? Yes, it's all atomic. Um, we'll get to some examples in a minute, but I'm rushing because 18 minutes is not a very long time, it turns out. So, in the set project, we provide the Rados gateway. That consists of, you know, it's an HTTP server. It's been several different ones over the years, but the important part is it's an HTTP server on the front end, and then we plug into that with a bunch of custom code that speaks, that then makes Liberados calls. And so at the front end, you get HTTP, S3, or Swift, and at the back end, we're speaking Rados calls. There are, in S3, there's a whole lot of things you have to do, but sort of the basics are that you have to do on ob you have to be able to put an object, you have to be able to get the object and be able to delete it. All of those objects in S3 live in namespaces called buckets, and you can so you can create or delete buckets. And in particular, and crucially in S3, you can list all of the objects in a bucket. Um, in Rados, you cannot do listing because we're a hugely horizontally scalable system. We don't provide, we don't maintain any kind of index of our own. So if you want to build an S3 speaking system on top of Rados, you have to build your own index and store it somewhere. Um, also, S3 allows very large objects, gigabytes or terabytes. Obviously, that's not going to fit in memory, so it's not going to work for Rados. So you need to do some kind of chunking system. And you need to deal with the fact that you might have, you know, different people putting the same object through different gateways. And then when they do that, you still need to have, you know, a coherent data structure inside of Rados that you read, and you need to not leak space. So let's look about how we could design it. This is not exactly the same design that the actual Rados gateway uses because it does a lot more features than we've talked about here. But sort of as an example, um, let's say that we want to maintain a bucket index, and that's just, you know, a list of all the objects in the bucket. We can store those, that list in OMAP, where every key is one of the S3 objects, and we don't really care about the value. And so when we do a put, we can update that index to say we're putting an object. But to deal with the fact that there might be a bunch of Rados objects associated with an S3 object, and that maybe you overwrite an S3 object and need to do that you know, all atomically, even though you know, it might be 10 Rados objects, so you can't like read it through and then start getting new ones, we're going to have a tag. And that tag is going to be unique on every on, on every put. And so when we get a put, then we'll start write, and then we'll then we'll record in the bucket. We have this new tag that we're writing down, and then you'll go right away and put those objects or write those objects into Rados with the tag. And then when you're done writing the objects in Rados, we're going to update the bucket index to say, okay, for object foo, we've got this tag bar. And so read off bar whenever you want foo, and then you can delete whatever might previously have been representing the foo object. And you can do this in Rados, or in Librados. You start off with, you know, your tag, your object name, your bucket. You need to get those from somewhere. Um, we're going to use a map to represent the, the new OMAP, even though it's really just a pair, because that's how the interface works. We're going to set the new OMAP's tag, with, you know, foo to the, or sorry, bar. The new OMAP's tag will be bar to the name foo. We will, and then we're just going to invoke the function omap set on the IO context. And then this particular one, we're using synchronous ones because they're shorter to write on the screen. So we're just that'll just block until the until the omap has been persisted on disk. And at that point, you've written down on disk. Okay, I have this new tag. It's called foo, or it's called bar. Um, at that point, we need to go off and write, you know, bar dot zero, bar dot one, bar dot two, however many objects it takes in Rados. And then once we've done, we say, okay, so we want to find out if there's anyone else named foo that already exists so that we can clean them up if they do. So we're going to look up, you know, that person, the object name, and we're going to have a map that's the result of the lookup in, in OMAP. And again, it's a map instead of a pair because you might want to look up more than one thing at a time. We are going to set the... Oh yeah, this is preparation. And so this is in case we're racing, because maybe some other Rados gateway or you know, some other S3 speaking gateway is also putting the object foo. So we do a git vals by keys operation where we say, hey, like Rados, tell me if there is an object named foo in the system. And we're gonna record the version of the bucket index when we saw that. 
and then we're going to say, okay, so we want to set the op. So, so we so we save the name of any pre or the tag of any previous object, and so we want to now set the new OMAP value for that to point to our new tag. But we set. But first of all, we set the assert version, which applies which applies to the next value. So that says, okay, we're going to make sure that when we try to do an update, that the version matches what we read the last time. And if that succeeds, you return zero, and so we're done. And then we can just delete the old. If we'll delete the old stuff that we got out. Otherwise, we'll go read the object, read the bucket index again, and say, "Hey, what's the other guy's name for other guy's tag for foo?" Because I want to put foo, um, and then we'll try it again until we win the race. Um, yeah. Do you need to uh, store the number of chunks? The question is, do you need to store the number of chunks? Um, I didn't really address that here. You might, you might not. It depends on what your um, how your system's set up in places that we haven't described. Um, there are a lot of obvious, solution, obvious ways to improve this. Um, first of all, we were looking at the version, and that changes whenever anyone writes a new OMAP. We can use the OMAP compare operation that I was talking about before to only check if, to only, make, to only care about that specific key, whether someone's changed the value of foo. Um, and we can use asynchronous operations instead, which in a real system you probably want to do, because no one likes blocking while you go out over the network. But that's sort of the basics of how you can do interesting things with Librados other than writing to a storage system. The other way, so way to program against the Ceph system or against Librados is to inject code directly into the OSD. So we have this thing called object classes. Object classes literally are shared libraries that the OSD loads on demand that have a particular format. Um, they're invoked via Librados. There's an exec call that takes you know, the object that you want to invoke the, the, new, the new class against, the name of the class, and the name of the method within the class that you want to invoke. And then we have these buffer lists for input data and output results. Um, and the reason they're buffer lists like that is because you, know, you might want to put in an integer and get back an integer, or you might want to you know, put in a an image format resolution and get back a JPEG of that size or whatever. Um, so we just, it's, it's just, you know, buffers and you can interpret them however you want within your system. You can write anything you can express in C++ um, and that you can do, and that Rados is capable of doing. You can, you can make use of all of those calls. Um, this, we can't talk about why, but there's a limit where anything that does write the system is not allowed to return very much data. That's just unfortunate, but true. Um, and an object class, when you invoke it, again, no matter what it's doing, it all runs atomically against that object so that it either succeeds or fails as a unit. And you cannot have you know, multiple people invoke object classes on the same object at the same time, and one of them will get there first and run, and then the other one will run, and they don't, they don't collide with each other at all, no matter what you're doing. Um, so... This allows you to do more powerful things. In our case, let's say that we wanted to maintain a log on the bucket index of the objects that we've you know, created and, and, and the objects that are pending for delete, rather than just trying to keep track of them all live. Um, if we want an ordered list, that's not something you can do with Librados unless you have some external means of ordering the system because you, know, you, you can't order them <laughs> um, because timestamps are not reliable. So instead of doing the Librados calls that we were doing before, we're, we're going to make them invoke classes. We can have them, you know, a prepare put and a finish put and a, you know, get the next thing to delete and a, hey, I deleted that thing set of calls that are all object class methods and, um, and are sort of, you know, invoked by the Librados user, but all the code for doing the object manipulation lives inside of the OSD. And then, you know, when you want to do deletes, you can clean stuff up later on in some separate location. So I've written some example functions for how you do that. This one's a prepare put. So we get this method context t thing. That's sort of the, it's an opaque pointer that's, that you need to pass around when you're doing calls in because that's how, how the Rados OSD keeps track of its own state for a particular operation. And then you've got your buffer list inputs and outputs. Um, and you'll need to decode those, but you know we just got an object name and a tag because we're preparing a put, 
And so they're just stored in that input buffer list. And then we're going to say, all right, we want to set a particular OMAP value. And that's what this match.val function does. And we want to get the current version. Oh, and because we want a log that we're doing this create, then, and we want that log to be ordered, then we're going to construct a name that is the magic string create, followed by the current version we're on, because that'll ensure lexicographic ordering, and then followed by the name of the object we've actually created. And then we just also set that as another OMAP in the bucket. Um, and then we've succeeded, so we return success. Similarly, for we finish this put, someone's staring the door at me. <laughs> okay. Are they waiting for I don't think it's a fire, so. <laughs> All right, so when we finish a put, then again, we've got the same sort of parameters, um, but, we wanna f but we need to find out if there was some other, uh, some other object that already existed with the same name, so we're gonna look it up, and that's the git val, and we have to do the decode it to find out what it, de um, we get back bufferless and things, so we need to find out what their names were. We can, we got that in memory, so we're good now. We write the new name to override it. We, and then we need to append again the delete log, so that's the magic string delete, followed by the version of the bucket, followed by the old contents of that, um, of, of, of that value, or of that object name. And we succeeded because we're not checking any success values, so we better have succeeded, and so we return zero. Similarly, you can, um, when we want to start doing deletes, then we have a git next delete function, and a remove delete function where you just say, hey, like, read back to me what the next thing to delete is, and that's sorted, and we get one thing out of it um, with the map git keys. So again, it's, we want to get the first entry in the map that follows a delete key, and that delete key doesn't actually need to exist, it's just a let's see, graphic sorting thing. We want to get only one key, we want to get to go into the keys set, and we also need a boolean for whether there are more keys following it or not, but we don't care about that. Um, and then we just return that back out to the libretos caller via the buffer list. And for the remove delete, similar process, but we're removing one. Now the Liberatos user actually invoking these calls looks sort of similar to what they were doing, only instead of doing the OMAP updates themselves with the loops in case of races, they just invoke this execute, this exact function. So we've got the object class is called index, and we want to invoke the prepare put function, and we give it our inputs and outputs, which are bufferless that we prepared ahead of time. Um, and then we need to write the data down for the tag, and then we say, hey, it's cool, we're done. So we do the finish put. And then, it's, and then you know, we haven't done any deletes here because that's logged and we can do it later, which is generally good in case of a bunch of things that when you're trying to actually build a system like this. But then you do have to delete it at some point, so you've got your garbage collection process running or whatever. And he says, hey, uh, what's the next entry for, that I should delete? And that's an exec function call on get next delete, and then you know you do the delete, and then you say, hey, exec, remove that I need to do this delete because I'm done now. And that is the end of my prepared slides. There's a lot more information available at ceph.com or on IRC or on our GitHub pages with specific examples for how to use these in a lot more detail than I could give you right now. Um, and we have four minutes for questions but I've all scared you too much. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, I'll be around. Thanks very much, guys. Enjoy the conference.